by Ed Shaw from livingout.org called What's Wrong with a Permanent, Faithful, Stable, Same-Sex Sexual Relationship? Um, now, could I just point out there are almost none of these? I mean, the surveys are clear um, that if permanent, faithful, stable, opposite sex sexual relationships, that is, long marriages, are rare enough. Um, you know, one thing watching the uh, funeral of President George H.W. Bush yesterday, and then again today, actually in Houston, uh, real reminder, 73 years of marriage. You've got to take your hat off to that. You've got to, you've got to salute that. That's, uh, and obviously a very good marriage, um, in the sense of the real commitment uh, going on there. Anyway, uh, that's rare enough. Far more rare is the idea of a permanent, faithful, stable, same sex sexual relationship. That almost never happens. And if it does, it's almost always going to be amongst women, not amongst men. Uh, it's somewhat of a, of a elusive thing. But here's, here's part of the article, and here's why I wanted to comment on it. Um, subtitle says, the good in something doesn't make it right in God's sight. We'd be crazy to deny the good in permanent, stable, faithful, same-sex sexual relationships. Read accounts of the gay community of the height of the AIDS epidemic, and you'll be moved to tears by the self-sacrificial love of couples who devotedly nurse both loved ones and complete strangers. We need to realize how much the gay community has to teach us about the meaning of the word community. Now, analyzing this from a Christian worldview, um, you, you immediately are, are sensing that the term good here is being used not as it would be derived from a Christian concept, but from a worldly concept. Um, he says, Andrew Marin uh, writes, I have never met a more loving community in my life than the GLBT community. Obviously, there are exceptions in any community, but in general, I've found that GLBT people don't care if you're skinny, hairy, fat, pimpled, a millionaire, or dead broke. There is room for everyone. All they want is to give the same love to others as they want to receive themselves. Um, you know, I've certainly read this coming from those promoting that community. Um, but obviously, from a Christian worldview, you have to step back and go, wait a minute. The fundamental foundation of this community is selfish, self-centered, and does not lead to the flourishing and advancement of the individuals involved with it. How can you call this loving and good? These are the good and loving here are being used in completely secular contexts, not in any biblical context at all. There's no differentiation being made. This is very troubling. It goes on to say, we certainly don't deny that there are real elements of beauty in the relationship of the nice gay couple next door. Um, I do, I do and I will. Beauty is a biblically defined concept. Um, there is beauty in a 73 year long marriage of a man and a woman. I will deny that there's beauty in a 73 year long relationship between a man and a man because of what it has resulted in, in the diminishment of both. So I, I'm I'm not going to I'm not going to give in to this this uh, mantra being now promoted within conservative churches. Well, that's a beautiful thing. Uh, hold on a second. Um, it goes on to say their commitment and love. And again, I define commitment and love on biblical foundations, not on on secular foundations. Their commitment and love are part of God's common grace to humanity. So. So the relationship and, and the long lastingness of it is part of common grace. Um, could this be transferred to any other aberrant, unnatural, disordered sexual relationship? Take out homosexual and, and put pederastic in here. Does that fit? Ho hopefully you go, no. Okay. Why? Where's the difference? What's, what's the issue here? Um, the happiness your niece is enjoying 
is a good that God has created for us to enjoy. Her happiness is real. I guess there was a question up above, I'm sorry, that I forgot to, to grab, um, that someone had, uh, had asked that specifically uh, mentioned uh, that that would give some type of a context to it. But anyway, um, the happiness your niece is enjoying is a good that God has created for us to enjoy. You're, you're telling me that a person who enjoys a disordered relationship and receives joy from that, this is a part, is a good that God created for us to enjoy. No, by, by the very act and orientation, they are shutting themselves off from the good that God intended for us to enjoy. And then it says, her happiness is real. This, this is at livingout.org. This is one of the speakers that goes out into churches, conservative churches, and is presenting this. C could anyone imagine this five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago? I, 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 I can't. Now, uh, goes on to say, but crucially, the good in something doesn't make other aspects of it right in God's sight. Well, it's true as far as it goes. I just dispute the good part. All human beings are capable of doing things that are good, if never completely so. Mm. I'm sensing a, a less than thoroughly biblical anthropology here. Um, but these echoes of our original perfection do not make us right in God's sight. Jesus' death is required for God to declare that so. In other words, the imputed righteousness of Christ. Similarly, the many good things we might see or experience in a permanent, faithful, stable, same-sex sexual relationship, when you have to come up with something that's an entire sentence long to describe it, it probably doesn't exist. Um, but this is something that's very, very common today, is from the other perspective, what you do is you create this image of this committed, monogamous, homosexual relationship. Now it's gotten expanded even beyond that. But this committed, uh, hum uh, uh, not homogenous, uh, committed uh, monogamous, with an M, not an H, committed monogamous homosexual relationship, which almost never exists or happens. It is by far the minority, 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 0.1% type thing. And you use that to then normalize the 99.9. .9. Nothing new about this. This is, this is pretty standard. Um, Similarly, the many good things we might see or experience in a permanent, faithful, stable, same-sex sexual relationship don't by themselves – now listen here. Listen to what goes up, happens here. Don't by themselves make the sexual aspect of the relationship legitimate. At its center is sex outside the permanent, stable, faithful marriage of a man and a woman, something that God has never declared to be right in his sight. The good in the relationship doesn't can't ever make its sexual dimensions right to him. Now, the narrow focus of that is something we would have to agree with. But notice what is fundamentally being done there. A division is ma being made between the, all the rest of the external good stuff, and the only thing that's really wrong is the sex act. And this, to me, is really problematic because the sex act is a part of an entire complex of desires that are disordered. Finding your, let's go back to, to Genesis, Eitzer Konegdo, your, your proper helpmate, the one that is corresponding to you in another male or in another female in a same-sex relationship is a disordered thing. And I'm getting the feeling that living out doesn't want to say that that's true. I'm getting the feeling that living out does not want to say that the actual homosexual desire is disordered and inappropriate. That's what I'm, I'm, I'm hearing, I think. And by just saying, well, it's just the sex act part. So everything else can be good. There's nothing wrong with that. It's the sex act part that is wrong. That is very problematic. Uh, and then it goes on uh, uh, to say, uh, but of course, all this begs the question, why is a same-sex sexual relationship so wrong in God's sight? And then goes to the second key truth, real sex is unity in difference. That would go to the Eitzer Konegdo uh, issue 
as it as it as it should. But I'm I'm just really concerned with the uh, acceptance amongst the, the growing acceptance amongst formerly conservative, and I mean formerly as in ten years ago. I mean that's how fast this is happening. Um, formerly conservative individuals in the promotion of the idea that same-sex attraction is not in and of itself a disordered desire. I mean, this is what you had at Revoice. Uh, this is what you're, what you're getting here. Um, and it's, it's extremely uh, concerning to me, especially when it's being promoted in conservative churches, because I'll be honest, in conservative churches, you have not had a whole lot of meaningful teaching on this subject. We need to get to it, but a lot of those who are ministering in those churches are having to work through these issues themselves because this has not been something, uh, certainly wasn't something that was central in the teaching of seminaries when I was in school long ago. Um, and so it's something that a lot of ministers are extremely uncomfortable dealing with. We can't avoid it anymore. Um, but it, it takes us back to the first story, uh, and, and that is some of the responses I was seeing to that singer were not only very ungracious, but they were also marked by ignorance. And there's still a lot of ignorance on the part of conservative Christians who will say, oh, I'm against all that. But, but why? Why are you? What's the foundation? What's, what's the real issue? Uh, can you, can you enunciate in a meaningful, uh, compelling fashion? why it is that homosexuality is not something that uh, we can either just close our eyes to, or can you explain why it is destructive to God's purposes in someone's life? That's, and, and do so in a way that they could understand it, uh, that is biblically faithful. That really is a question that has to be, uh, has to be asked. So 